Howdy, this is Jim Rutt, and this is The Jim Rutt Show. Listeners have asked us to provide pointers to some of the resources we talk about on the show. We now have links to books and articles referenced in recent podcasts that are available on our website. We also offer full transcripts. Go to jimrutshow.com. That's jimrutshow.com. Today's episode is the first in a series of episodes on the scientific study of consciousness. Over the next few months, we'll be doing at least one episode a month on the topic. The researchers that we've booked so far include Christoph Koch, Antonio Damasio, Bernard Bars, and today's guest, Emery Brown. Emery Brown is a professor of anesthesia at the Harvard Medical School and Massachusetts General Hospital and professor of medical engineering and of computational neuroscience at MIT. He is the principal investigator at the Neuroscience Statistical Research Lab and is a practicing anesthesiologist. Welcome, Emory. Great. How are you doing, Jim? Thanks for having me. Yeah, great to have you here. It's interesting. I connected with Emory by chance. I was at a event at the Brain and Cognitive Science Department at MIT, and we happened to be sitting at the same lunch table. I got into a conversation about his work, and I go, holy shit. Why haven't I heard about this guy, right? People who listen to my show know that I'm very interested in the science of consciousness as opposed to the blather about consciousness that we hear so much about. And this is why I invited Emery to be on first, because Emery's work, you know, it struck me. Since I heard about, why haven't I heard about that? Why aren't other people doing this? Which is that, you know, his insight was that anesthesia, bringing people in and out of consciousness on a regular basis ought to be a really excellent probe on the nature of consciousness, you know, at the deepest level or nearly the deepest level. So hence, some of our later guests on this series will get into other aspects of it. And, you know, we may have some opinions about that too, but we're really going to focus on his work around the study of consciousness in the context of anesthesiology. Surprisingly, this is a relatively new field of inquiry. Why don't you talk just maybe a little bit how you happen to come up with the idea? Well, as, as you mentioned, I'm a practicing anesthesiologist. And to, to be honest with you, I didn't really think that much about the science of kind of like what was happening. I, I was practicing anesthesiology for a number of years. I've been doing it for probably, you know, maybe 15 or so years. And what was happening was, is that I'm also a statistician. So my research was centering around developing statistical methods to better analyze neuroscience data. And as a consequence, I had a lot of interactions with neuroscientists. And I realized that the ideas that they were using to study other questions, such as memory formation, vision, cognitive perception, they could be used to study anesthesia and that nobody was really doing it. So I'd say I began about, you know, in earnest, probably about 15 years ago, you know, using trying to adapt the ideas from systems neuroscience to think about to think about anesthesia. And I think part of the reason that this hasn't happened before or wasn't uh, sort of viewed that way is that anesthesiology, because we give a lot of drugs to patients, is viewed as a subfield of pharmacology. It's not viewed as a subfield of neuroscience, even though the drugs are acting in the brain and central nervous system. Hmm, makes sense. And, you know, that's unfortunately the downfall of academia sometimes is too much in the column, right? Instead of going across. And so one of the things that some of the newer ways of thinking about science has really opened up these fields that go across disciplinary columns a century to allow this kind of thinking. So definitely commend you for having been one of the people who broke through and said, ah, this and this go together and we can learn something new. Before we jump into the details of your research, let's lay out some basic concepts for our listeners. I mean, let's start with just, you know, the simplest bits of brain architecture, the, you know, cerebral cortex, thalamus, cerebellum, et cetera. So before I do that, let me just say practically what is, anest- what is anesthesia? What is, what is general anesthesia? Because w- once you just understand, hear the definition, you can see why it's possible to think about it without necessarily thinking about the brain. So it's a state which is reversible. It's drug-induced. And you're not supposed to be aware of what's going on. You're supposed to be unconscious. You're supposed to not have pain. You're supposed, it's nice if you're not moving around and you should not be able to form memories of what's, what's going on. And your physiology, heart rate, 
blood pressure, stress levels should all be totally controlled. And again, all that's, you know, reversible. So those are descriptions that we give. So there are no neuroscience details there at all. In other words, it's it's almost like you know it when you see it and you know it when it's not working and you need to do something different. So you can see why you can work empirically with the concept and not have really engaged, you know, formally in thinking about the brain at all, the central nervous system. Interesting. And you guys did some experiments on kind of a continuum on loss of consciousness and return of consciousness, having people do some activities as you slowly increase the amount of anesthesia they gave them. Maybe talk about that a little bit. Right, exactly. So so what we did was we had volunteers uh, agree to let us anesthetize them. And we did exactly what you said. We gave them increasing doses of propofol which is one of the most widely used anesthetic. It's the anesthetic, which is associated with, unfortunately, is associated with, with Michael Jackson's demise. We gave them increasing doses of it and then decreasing doses. The whole process taking about an hour to reach the maximum dose and about another hour or so to come down. And every four seconds, they were answering a question, a simple yes, no question. And, and then what we're able to do is actually see empirically when they stop responding and we, inter- and we turn that, we term that the, the point of loss of consciousness. And by the same token, as the drug dose decreased, we could see when they started responding again. So we had a very behaviorally defined way of deciding, of defining loss and recovery of consciousness. And then the main thing that we were doing at the same time was measuring EEG across the entire head. So we could also then see how were the brain oscillations across the head changing as the person was losing consciousness with anesthesia when they reached the deepest level and also when they recovered all of that on a continuum both coming in as well as going out interesting that's a good place to jump to another one of my questions here is let's remind the audience of the various technologies we have for looking at the brain you know we have things like eeg and fMRI and single neuron recordings, et cetera, and they have different attributes in time and space. Maybe you could talk about that a little bit. Right, exactly. So for example, probably the easiest one to think about is the EEG. So you can put electrodes on the entire head and you can measure potentials, potential differences across the head. And the reason this yields information is you can think of the brain as just a large mass of electrochemical circuits. So there are always currents flowing. And the currents flow, the current flows represent brain activity. And so you can imagine if you give drugs, which are somehow altering brain function, brain physiology, brain dynamics, that there would be changes in those currents. And you could actually then measure that or observe that by looking at uh, the EEG. And that's indeed the case. And we'll get into detail later about how strong those, those changes are under anesthesia. Another very widely used technique for looking at the brain, again, speaking for the moment first about humans, actually, just to mention, so the EEG has been around since 1929. So, you know, it's basically, you know, 90 plus years old, and, but it still is a very widely used technique in research as well as for clinical purposes. And then, as you might be aware, there are a number of imaging techniques like functional magnetic resonance imaging, where you use the differences in the oxygenation state of the brain with changes in blood flow to make images of of parts of the brain. The difference between this and, let's say, EEG is EEG has very, very sort of precise up to millisecond time resolution, but perhaps very poor spatial resolution, whereas with the functional imaging, you can have very, very precise down to, you know, fractions of a millimeter uh, cubed resolution with the imaging, whereas the time resolution is on the order of seconds. So you can see that there are obvious trade-offs there. And then, you know, just behavioral studies, for example, just watching behavior and relating that to some of the EEG or MRI findings is something which is, you know, which is widely done as well. And and so I, I think that if we're talking now about humans, those are the primary techniques so we can do other sorts of imaging but let's say those are the primary techniques that are used to look at what's going on in humans there's a very special set of humans that you know we've used and a lot of other investigators who've looked at human neurophysiology have used and that's patients who have electrodes implanted in their brain because they have epilepsy and they need surgery to remove the epileptic focus that's because it's it, it can't be controlled with medications 
So the way this works is these patients have the electrodes implanted in their brain. They stay in the hospital for five to seven days off of medication. So they seize. And as they seize, the care team, neurologists, neuroradiologists, neurosurgeons, figure out where the seizure focus is. They then come back and remove the electrodes. And then they go on to have the, the area which is believed to be a pathologic resected. What this means is when these patients come back to the operating room and they have electrodes in their brain, you have the rare opportunity to record individual neural, the activity of individual neurons from parts of the human brain, which is extremely, a, you know, a very rich and sort of rare situation because normally we do those types of experiments in animals. So that is a, that has been a very rich source of information, not only for us, but for other people who've been studying, you know, various, you know, various questions in, in human neurophysiology. Yeah, interesting. It almost seems like Mother Nature is torturing us. She'll give us either time or space, but not both, right? With the fMRI giving us where and EEG giving us when. But And then the single neuron recordings are kind of a limited way to get both. And as you say, it's kind of difficult to do in humans. Not too many random volunteers are going to let you drive nails into their head. But with non-human primates, there's you know a fair amount of that work goes on. Right, exactly. And, and going back to the humans for a second, I mean, what you have there is an experiment of nature. I mean, you know, these patients have the electrodes implanted for therapeutic purposes. And then, you know, they're kind enough quite often to just perform some additional activities, maybe, again, execute a behavioral task or, you know, allow themselves to be part of a pr special protocol, in our case, for the induction of anesthesia, so that we can learn something, you know, from the fact that they're in, to, they've come into the hospital to, for therapeutic purposes. And that's, we're, we've been very grateful, you know, to those patients because they've enabled us to study the brain from a perspective that we, like you just suggested, wouldn't be possible in humans. Yeah, that's really great. And we should always appreciate these people who allow science to use their, you know, unfortunate medical condition to advance learning. That's a real gift to humanity. No question. There's no question about that. All right, last preliminary topic before we jump in, which is, this is really focusing on EEG, brain waves. Three things that we'll talk about a fair bit as we get into it are power, frequency, and phase. Maybe if you could define those three terms for our audience, that would be great. Right. So power is probably the easiest to understand. So if you have like a sine wave, which is going up and down, we can think of the power as being related to the amplitude of the sine wave. So the larger the amplitude, the greater the power, the smaller the amplitude, the less power the oscillation has. And, you know, it's either very often plotted as the square of the amplitude, you know, so A squared, or sometimes, you know, in, in decibels. So, you know, maybe, you know, the log to the base 10 of the amplitude squared, or 10 times the log of the base, to, log to the base 10 of the amplitude squared would be another way to, to represent it. But essentially, we can think of power as being related to the amplitude of the oscillation. And then the frequency is how many cycles of the oscillation do we see in a second? And what we're going to be talking about are going to be relatively low frequency oscillations, things which go from about you know one cycle per second up to, let's say at most, not too much beyond 20 or 30 cycles per second. And our, the normal brain rhythms where we're normally processing information is in the range of, let's say, 25 to about 40 or 50 cycles per second. So relatively higher frequency compared to the frequencies that we're going to be talking about for, for anesthesia. And phase refers to, so when you have an oscillation and you complete a cycle, you come around essentially 360 degrees. And so phase can be thought of a particular point in that cycle that you keep coming back to. So we can think of the minimum as one phase, the maximum as another phase, the place where you cross the mean might be, you know, a third phase. And those are useful markers to help us, you know, track, you know, phenomena in the oscillations uh, uh, across time. And one two sentence summary of what happens in anesthesia, when the drugs take over the brain, we go from high frequency, low amplitude oscillations to roughly speaking, large amplitude, low frequency oscillations. Very good introduction. Next, we're going to talk a little bit more about the specifics of the mechanisms and the impact on the brain networks of propofol. 
you know, I read, I don't know, 15 papers of your teams before this podcast. And you talk about some of the others, which we'll mention. We'll talk about their differences, which are interesting, some of the other drugs. But that's the one that your guys seem to, you and your people seem to have spent the most time thinking about. Let's talk a little bit about the nature of the networks that exist in the brain and then how those change as propofol impacts the brain. Right. So I, I guess the, uh, the the way to think about it is we can divide the brain. Um, let's divide the brain regions up into two areas. Let's say the, the cortex, so the, the outer layers of the brain, the ones that we, you know, we, we typically think about, you know, the frontal part being associated with maybe perception and cognition and the more posterior parts, you know, being associated with vision. And then we have areas kind of in the middle, which are associated with other, a whole range of functions, but particularly around the area, just to the, just probably in front of the ears, you know, the medial temporal lobe being associated with memory formation and also adding, you know, playing an important role in cognition. And then in this, right in the, in the middle, almost in, in the exact center of the brain is an area called the thalamus, which is a way station. It's like a relay. It relays all sorts of information, cognitive information, visual information, auditory information, sensory pain information. And so it's, it's kind of like a really, a very, very important stopping point or modulating point for a lot of information. And that, that's going to play a, an important role. We th- it plays an important role, we think, in, in the creation of anesthesia. And if you take the lower part of the brain, the part we call the brainstem, the part down below, it's the more primitive part of the brain. The cortex is usually often referred to as the neocortex, sort of the newer part of the brain, you know, developmentally thinking about our evolution from, you know, you know, reptiles to where we are now. The, the brainstem controls a lot of the very basic functions, you know, heart rate, breathing, and arousal. And arousal meaning the signals which emanate from the top part of the brain, the top part of the brainstem, meaning the midbrain and the pond. So the brainstem has three principal parts, the midbrain, the top, ponds, the middle, and then the the medulla down at the bottom. And the areas, there are various areas, what we call nuclei or centers there, that send projections up to the thalamus and send projections up to the cortex. And for this back of the envelope, statement at the moment, they generate what we call arousal. They keep us awake. So it's not enough to just be awake to be conscious. You have to be able to, you have to be able to be awake and also process information. So the uh, these signals that come from those parts of the brain are there to keep us awake. And then the cortex and thalamus and other parts can then process information. Oh, that'd be a great distinction between being awake and processing information. Is it possible to be awake and not processing information? Yeah. So you can imagine someone who is, just as an illustration, someone who's awake and delirious or someone who is, you know, um, you know, so they're someone who is drunk or that sort of thing. They're certainly awake. You know, they're saying things, they may be moving, what have you. But when you ask them a question, you don't get a coherent response. Got it. So their information processing is certainly addled, if not entirely gone. Exactly. Right, right. Interesting, interesting. Okay. Propofol, in particular, impacts certain sets of networks in distinction from some others. And it uses some different mechanisms from others. I believe this GABA-oriented drug mostly. You talked a little bit about that. Right. So so the brain has a number of... uh, neurotransmitter systems. And again, just to make a simple dichotomy, let's say they're ones that are primarily excitatory and ones that are primarily inhibitory. So an important inhibitory neuromodulator in the brain is are the GABAergic circuits. And so they use GABA. So they, there, is, there are, so if you have a neuron, so the kind of the fundamental building block of the brain or neurons. We have collections of neurons that transmit information throughout the brain via, by transmitting very small electrical impulses that are generated by these electrical chemical reactions that take place along the extent of the neurons you know, surface membrane. And when that happens, this occurs because various channels in the membrane open and close. And so you can make the system more excited by putting an excitatory input. You can make the system quieter or turned off or reduce its activity by putting in inhibitory inputs. And one of the principal 
mechanisms for inhibitory inputs are those which are mediated by GABA in what we call inhibitory, usually interneurons, as opposed to pyramidal neurons, which are more often than not excitatory. So when you give propofol, it binds to a very specific site on this receptor for, for GABA, and then it opens a channel in the membrane, and the channel lets in chloride. So chloride is a negative ion. So as it, as it enters from the outside of the cell, the inside of the cell becomes more and more negative. And the more negative the cell is, the less excited it is, the more difficulty it's going to have to actually propagate information that might be coming along from other neurons. So that's kind of the, what we think is the molecular mechanism through which the drug is acting on these membranes and sort of inhibiting what's happening in the brain. It's interesting that, you know, at a simplistic level, you can say, oh, it's you know, inhibition that should slow the brain. But actually, it turns out to be quite a bit more complicated than that. You know, parts of the brain become more active or at least particular frequencies become higher in amplitude and other parts become quieter. Could you talk about that a little bit? Right. So that's exactly what happens. So, you know, if, if, if things were just kind of laid out on a straight sheet and weren't interconnected, then as soon as you gave the propofol, everything would just probably just turn off. And the degree of turnoff would be in relation to how much propofol you gave, kind of almost in a linear fashion. But the parts of the brain are interconnected and you have networks, very intricate networks of inhibitory and excitatory neurons. So that when you inhibit one part, that might shut off the inputs going to another part. But those inputs, if they were if they were controlling this other part and now this that's gone, maybe that area becomes more active. And what we see is that as opposed to just the system shutting down, the system begins to oscillate. And, you know, one way to think about this is that the brain is this very, very complex integrated dynamical system. So by, by that, it means it has a lot of interconnections. So because of all these interconnections, it probably has natural kind of resonance frequencies the same way like when you when you thump the side of a you know some thump the side of thump the side of like a glass or something you can hear like a humming or a vibration so you have these intrinsic frequencies or and and so when you apply these drugs or you apply propofol in this sort of inhibitory way you push the the system to these kind of natural resonances. And these resonances depend upon what receptor you, you bound, what was bound by the, uh, you know, what was inhibited, what was excited, and then how that's connected to other parts of the brain. And it's, it's the same thing like, you've probably seen this movie on, uh, this video on YouTube where there's this bridge, I think it's in Tacoma, Washington. Oh yeah, the famous resonance of, the, of destroying the bridge. It's in every monster movie from the early 60s, right? Exactly, exactly. So what happens is all of a sudden the wind comes along and the wind finds the resonant frequency of the bridge. And what was a bridge, which was nice and flat, suddenly becomes a sine wave, right? And so that's exactly what happens with the electrochemical circuits. These circuits are driven to oscillate. And if you think of being able to go across the bridge, cars transiting across the bridge from one side to the other, now, just make the analogy, you, make, you have these oscillations, and so the electrical impulses are, have much more difficulty tra transmitting across the brain. And so you can see why you're going to start inhibiting information flow. It's sort of a, kind of like a, a back-of-the-envelope way of thinking of it. And, and as, you, as you create these oscillations, you have long periods where the, where the membranes are, of the cells are quite low. So they have to be excited in order to... For information, for to for they have to be they have to be raised in order for the action potentials, which are these electrical impulses, to be transmitted. And if they're not, if they're lowered, then you're going to be less likely to transmit information. And then if you do that in enough brain regions, let's say you do it in the thalamus, you do it in the cortex, you're doing it in parts of the brainstem, then it's easy to understand why the brain is going to be shut off under anesthesia. Yeah, and as I understand the mechanism from reading the papers. In propofol, for sure, the big mechanism seems to be big, tall, high-powered, low-frequency waves. Right. That's what that's what we've seen both in our in our human studies. So I should not only both, but in our human studies, in our non-human primate studies, as well as in our 
our rodent studies, you see these very large oscillations somewhere between 0.1 to 4 cycles per second. And then in humans, you also see a, another oscillation, which is very, very strong, which is around 10 hertz, about between 8 to 12 cycles per second. And these two sets of oscillations come on. And in this study that we talked about earlier with propofol, where we looked at the relationship between when people stop responding, or as we, as we termed it for that study, lost consciousness, and the onset of these oscillations, it was strongly associated. The onset of the, 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 un, the state of unconsciousness was, strong, was strongly correlated with the appearance of these low frequency, sort of slow 0.1 to 1, 4 hertz oscillations and these, these alpha oscillations, these 10 hertz oscillations. Now, the other thing I picked up, I think I understand it, but I want you to clarify if I was right or if I'm wrong, tell me so. It also struck me as kind of interesting from an information processing perspective that these slow waves, they differ in phase in different brain regions, which in some sense would make it more difficult for the brain regions to communicate with each other while this is going on. Could you talk about that a little bit? Right. So what we saw in our human studies was that, and then and we should just you know qualify this so we can just give you a, a real sense of how, um, you know, how far we can interpret this. But what we noticed in the human studies in these patients that had epilepsy, when we recorded from their brains and they received propofol for induction of anesthesia, and we looked at how the oscillations were related to one another across the different brain regions. And this is areas primarily in the medial temporal lobe. So the area of the brain, as I said earlier, which is primarily, well, one of its primary functions is memory formation. The oscillations there seemed to be out of phase. So when one was going up, the other was coming down or vice versa. And that seemed to be sort of happening pretty much all across that whole local area. And then if just, again, thinking back of the envelope, if there has to be some coordination of activity across regions in order to transmit information, if the oscillations are out of phase, one is up and the other is down, and one's in the midpoint and the other is in the, in the high point, that situation alone is going to make it very, very difficult to, for the neurons to line up and send information reliably across, uh, you know, across brain regions. So this breaking up of the oscillations, in this case, the, across the medial temporal lobe, was one of the phenomena that we felt was associated with the state of unconsciousness. In some of our more recent work, um, where we've been able to record more extensively from non-human primates, it may be what may be happening in other parts of the brain might be something on the other extreme. Some of the areas might even be hyper, they might even be sort of hypersynchronous. In other words, everybody's totally in sync. They're totally in sync for a period. But in, in other words, you're locked. You don't have the flexibility to communicate as you need to. So being hypersynchronous also could be another cause of unconsciousness. And th that's analogous to what we can envision happening with a seizure, for example. I'm not saying the people under anesthesia are seizing. I'm just saying it's analogous to a seizure. You see these very regular rhythms, which then themselves make it difficult for normal information or normal oscillations to propagate through you know, the system or normal neural spiking activity to propagate through the system. So therefore you can understand why either a loss of synchrony, as you're saying, things being out of phase, or things being too much in phase would both be associated with, could both be associated with someone being unconscious. Yep. I remember reading about the fact that some of the higher frequency, theta frequencies can be highly synchronized, which, as you say, is another way to lose the ability to transmit information. So let's pop up a little, a little bit and talk about at least something we think we know about human consciousness, which are the networks that support it. Two that you guys reference in your work is the default mode network and the frontoparietal networks. Can you talk about those just a little bit, what they do in humans and you know, at least what it, it appears that happens to break down those networks under anesthesia, propofol at least for sure? Yeah, so, so these are areas, you know, the fault mode network is a network which has been defined by executing a kind of a very basic kind of fMRI experiment where you, you, you basically have someone line a scanner and you say, can you just think about nothing for a while? And let me just see who's talking to whom. And you can make, you can image that and see what the dynamics are. Look who's, who, which parts of the brains is correlated with whom. 
And then from that, you can imagine as you did an experiment, right, where you then either had someone execute a behavioral task or they're given a drug, in this case, an anesthetic, what have you, you could look at how that, you could look at how the activity in those regions changed. The parietal area is an area which, like I said, the frontal area, let's say we think of cognition, maybe the medial temporal lobe, especially with memory and some of the areas along the, the more uh, um, just off the, uh, the midline of the cortex are associated with, let's say, like language or, or speech production. The parietal area, which is just sort of moving back from the center of their head, just about halfway between the, ma the main point in the back of your head, the occiput there, this parietal area is used for integrating information across the brain. So again, it's another place where if you were to disrupt this, what that part of the brain does, it's a prime candidate for creating a state of unconsciousness. And so, see, that's why, and to some extent, the problem I work on is much easier. I mean, there are all these places which are seemingly play critical roles for producing consciousness. We know they're critical um, because we've learned empirically from, you know, neurologic you know, examination of neurological patients over the years that when they're da damaged to these areas, they're their alterations in level of consciousness. But then the, the more challenging question, which, you know, my a number of my colleagues are working on is how do these areas integrate and come together to produce a state of consciousness? You see, my, my question is simpler. It's just like saying, how is anesthesia breaking these areas? And if we see that it's having a substantial effect in the parietal cortex, for example, or it's having a substantial effect in the thalamus or key areas in the brainstem, then our inference, and I underscore inference, is that that is one of the mechanisms through which the drug is producing unconsciousness. But then how that area then plays a role in consciousness is still an open question. Yeah, indeed. And it is easier to break something than it is to make something, right? <laughs> I mean, what I like to sort of suggest, I say, you know, like, imagine my cell phone here, and it's a very complex device, but I can tell you, if I pull out the battery, it's going to turn off. I put the battery back in, it's going to come back on. And I know that that's a very effective mechanism for rendering my cell phone inoperative, but it doesn't tell you, tell you how the cell phone works. Though I imagine if, you know, one were doing, especially with sufficient time resolution, studying the reformation of, you know, default mode network and front of parietal networks, et cetera, task mode networks, as people are coming out of anesthesia, there might be some insights into how those systems stitch together themselves into a systems of systems that results in our familiar form of consciousness. I think you're right. I think it is a, a very productive area of inquiry. The, I think the challenge is that, you know, there's a lot of redundancy in the, in, in the brain. And then trying to say, you know, this is the, you know, the, the fundamental unit that's necessary to turn the brain on and induce consciousness is a challenging, I think, statement to make because there's a lot of redundancy and a lot of interconnections. Um, but, but you're right, you know, watching how someone maybe comes out of anesthesia. And the other thing, too, is because of maybe the state of the patient, the nature of the surgery, you know, the particular combination of drugs that are used, how you may come out in one situation might be how, different from how you come out in another. So you can imagine one pathway activating primarily when you came out one way, let's say using sevoflurane, one of the inhaled ethers, and you come out a whole different way in, a, in a, just on that given day because of the state you're in with, with propofol. But they effectively connected up enough areas in order for you to recover consciousness, if you see what I mean. Exactly. And it seems to me that variance would actually be a very interesting probe on essentially the, you know, the network self-assembly that appears to be going on in the brain. It is. I mean, and it's made more difficult by the fact that there is this very, very intricate, you know, redundancy, you know, across a lot of these networks and which makes it more, I, I think there are two things as far as anesthesia. I think anesthesia clearly produces a profound states of unconsciousness. That's for sure. But one of the things that's occurring is if we just take a drug like propofol, which acts on GABAergic circuits or a drug like sevoflurane, one of the inhaled ethers, which also works primarily on those same circuits, those circuits are everywhere in the central nervous system, in the brain. So they're in the brainstem, they're in the thalamus, they're in the cortex, they're down in the spinal cord. 
So, and all of them contribute to some extent to rendering you unconscious. So you, you never have like a clean experiment where it just goes to the thalamus or just goes to an isolated area of cortex or it just goes to an isolated area of brainstem. So that also makes it more challenging because you have, you have redundant networks and you have a drug that goes everywhere. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Though I did, in one of your papers, I read somebody at least proposing potentially trying putting an anesthesia chemical in a specific location in the thalamus as a possible probe. Yeah, for sure. So we, we did some studies a few years ago. Laura Lewis, who's one of my PhD students, uh, did for her PhD, as part of her PhD thesis work, you know, did some optogenetic studies where she um, activated. So the thalamus, again, this important way station sits in the center of the brain, has around it a net, which is called the reticular nucleus of the thalamus. And this net is an inhibitory net. So when information comes out of the thalamus going to, let's say, cortex, it gets modified. And so it controls the outflow of information coming out of the thalamus by sort of down-regulating it or, or use, applying some degree of inhibition to it. And different parts of the, this network, this net around the thalamus, control the outputs of different parts of the cortex. So what she did was she stimulated optogenetically parts of this reticular, the reticular nucleus of the thalamus, and she was able to show that she generated these sort of slow wave oscillations in the corresponding parts of the, of the cortex. Now, you'd have to get the whole network or large parts of the whole network to probably make the animal unconsciousness, but it did suggest that you could probably, you know, control a network like that and induce, you know, and induce a state of decreased arousal. Now, interestingly, and something I had never heard of, I also dug out of one of the papers, was that the opposite appears to be true as well, that a stimulus to a certain thalamic region, which is the intralaminar nucleus, seems to actually revive animals from anesthesia. Yeah. Well, so going back, actually, so going back to the human work before that, so my colleague, Nico Schiff in New York at Cornell University showed back in, in 2007 in, you know, a very... Um, what was, you know, I think a very seminal paper where he, he had a gentleman who had been in a mentally conscious state for, you know, a number of years. And they did a very set, of, a very detailed set of experiments on him. They implanted, you know, electrodes in his central thalamus. And they showed that when they stimulated his central thalamus, they could induce a state of arousal where he had a higher level of functioning, was able to, you know, do more activities than he could when he when the, when the stimulation wasn't there, suggesting that that you know if we can learn more about these arousal systems, you know we can maybe help people like recover from coma. So conceptually, barring on that idea, my colleague Ken Salt at Mass General Hospital has done a number of studies, and this is a very active area of research for him. Is trying to understand can you either chemically or in the case of animals stimulate parts of the brain and bring an animal out of anesthesia. And he's shown that successfully that you can stimulate various arousal centers. Again, these areas which come up primarily from like the brain stem going up into thalamus and cortex. And if you drive excitation to an extent which is can override the inhibition of the anesthetic state, you can wake an animal up. And he's shown that reliably by stimulating a number of areas like the ventral tegmental area, which is in the midbrain part of the of the uh, brainstem. And also in another set of experiments, Krista Van Doit, who, who's one of my, uh, one of my colleagues as well, has stimulated areas like the parabrachial nucleus, again, a nucleus down in, in the brainstem there and shown, you know, very similar, you know, very similar ideas. So again, this has two immediate benefits for us. It suggests that maybe it's a way to help turn the brain back on and get people functioning again after anesthesia. But it's also translated now into a protocol that's being carried out by our colleague, Brian Edlow at Mass General Hospital, who is using these ideas to try to help people recover more rapidly from coma, patients with brain injury to recover more rapidly from coma. Very interesting. Okay, next question. People listening to the show know that I'm always interested in nonlinear dynamics, you know, systems that have phase transitions, et cetera. So when we think about dose dependency of, let's say, propofol, does the response, is it more or less linear and incremental, or can you see phase transitions that occur as dose increases? Well, actually, it, it's very interesting. You, you do see these 
what start to be very uh, nonlinear dynamics um, as you increase the dose. So if we take propofol, um, so we can probably identify maybe six, perhaps even seven sort of states that the, that the brain circuits go through. Again, this is looking at, this is in looking at the EEG or local field potentials, which might be recorded directly from rodents or, or non-human primates. So just to sort of take you through them, if you give a, a low dose at some low doses in, in a good number of patients, the brain will first become excited, right? And then what happens is you start to see the formation of very, very regular beta oscillations on the order of about 12 to 16 cycles per second. And then depending upon how the drug is given, if it's given as a large bolus, just sort of a big dose all at once, you may next start to see very large slow oscillations. And then if the drug doses increase further, you'll go into, you'll have a very obvious, what you again, what you're talking about, like a phase transition, where you'll see there be bursting and then flat, bursting and flat. And if you increase the dose even further, you can have an entire flattening of the EEG. Now, if the drug had been given more slowly, had been given more slowly on the induction phase, when you went from those beta oscillations, you would then go not to just pure slow oscillations, you would go to slow oscillations with alpha oscillations riding on top. So slow oscillations, again, a slow delta, about 0.1 to 4 hertz with alpha oscillations, something in the order of about 8 to 12 hertz. And then if you were to give more drug, you would then go into burst suppression and then into these, you got basically a flat EEG. The, the point being is, is that when you look at the nature of these oscillations, you're moving across different frequency bands. And I said roughly going from high frequency, you know, small amplitudes down to low frequency, large amplitude. And when you look at the nature, the shapes of those oscillations, it's very clear that you're making, there's nonlinear dynamics involved. This, this is, these, are, these are no way linear systems. Yeah, it would, be, it would have been my guess. I'm glad to hear that confirmed. Another area that I saw some reference to, not a lot in your work, is age differences in response to anesthesia. That's kind of an interesting probe if we think about it. Yeah. No, it's very important because um, one of the things that we've been trying to do is to in, you know, encourage anesthesiologists to use the EEG when they take care of patients in the operating room because... So just to complete the first, the thought of how we think the drugs are working. So the drugs are creating these oscillations. The oscillations impair how the different parts of the brain communicate. And by that, they're modulating how the neurons can spike. So creating long periods where there's inhibition and the neurons can spike. And then either hyper, hyper coupling or, you know, making certain regions more synchronous and other regions, you know, sort of, you know, less syn synchronous. Now, what's interesting about that is, you can see that very easily on the EEG when you're in, in the OR. For example, if you have an EEG setup, and this is very standard monitors, which are you know readily available commercially. And there, there are about three or four things that we've learned over the years. One is, as I was just describing a second ago, the EEG patterns change very systematically with drug dose. That's the first thing. The second thing is drugs in the same class have very similar EEG patterns because it makes sense they're mechanistically working, you know, the, the same way. So you can distinguish drugs by the patterns they generate on the EEG. And then the third major point is that, as you just said, the, the patterns change in a very systematic way with age. And they, they go through a, a, a situation with, you know, very young kids having just, meaning zero to three months, having just slow oscillations then having, thinking about propofol for the moment, having just slow oscillations, then the slow and alpha oscillations appear somewhere around four months. And then the amplitude of all these oscillations and the width of these, these bands increase and they reach a maximum somewhere between six to eight years of age. And then there's a very, very slow decline in the amplitudes of the oscillations, you know, as we get older and we start to lose our ability to produce like the alpha oscillation as we get older, pretty much across you know, most adults. And one of the things that's occurring there, going back to your original question about changing with age, initially what I was describing is probably neurodevelopment. You know, it takes time for connections to form. 
And then as more connections are formed, you have the pro you have the likelihood of these drugs acting on these circuits and generating the oscillations. And then as you get older, you know, the brain is aging, there's there's degeneration. And then with that degeneration, the ability of those those same neurons to transmit information or to be part of an oscillatory dynamic sort of becomes, you know, much more difficult. So the oscillations become weaker. The practical implication of this is that particularly for older patients is we can follow these oscillations when someone's under anesthesia and use them in a very reliable way to, to guide drug dosing. And what I can say for myself, and I think this is the case for other anesthesiologists who, who regularly use the EEG, you're able to administer a much more precise dose of anesthetic and, and you're less likely to overdose patients and meet their anesthetic needs is if you do it blindly, you're not using the EEG. Interesting. That was going to be my next question, which is the clinical implications. Over the last six years, I got anesthesia, anesthesized, and whatever the... Anesthetized. Anesthetized, yeah, twice. Once general for a kind of long and complicated thing, and the other one, whatever, is just, just shy of general for a hip replacement. Fairly grisly to imagine that I wasn't fully anesthetized for that, but such it goes. But neither time did the anesthesiologist use the EEG. Where does your technique of using EEGs to carefully modulate dosage stand in terms of clinical acceptance and, and, and diffusion? Well, you know, we, um, I mean, the idea hasn't diffused as far as you know, we would like it to. I mean, we weren't the first to suggest this. I mean, other people had suggested using, you know, the EEG and sort of EEG-based indices have been around, you know, since the early 90s. I mean, the part of this that we've tried to do is understand the dynamics and give and give a very detailed characterization by drug and also relate them to the mechanism because the oscillations relate directly to the mechanism that we, that as we see it, is how the drugs are acting in the brain. So it's not just looking at a pattern and just remembering a pattern. The fact that you see these dynamics is actually quite informative of how the drug is acting in the brain. And so, for example, if I tell you when you see slow oscillations in, in, in the EEG, so oscillation between 0 0.1 to, to 1 cycle per second, and when we looked in our non-human primates, when we looked in our, you know, our epilepsy patients, you know, our subjects in our anesthesia studies, we saw that neural activity was grossly altered such that it would be very difficult next to impossible to be unconscious then you can rest assured that it, when you see those oscillations in someone under anesthesia with just a monitor in, in the OR, that you can make the same inference. So you can use that as a way to understand, you know, relate the neurophysiology, what we've learned in our studies, to, the, to taking care of a patient in the operating room. Um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's hard to change clinical practice because many anesthesiologists have given anesthesia for years without using the EEG, and they make inferences of how much anesthesia is needed, looking at things like change in heart rate and blood pressure, maybe whether or not the patient is moving or this sort of thing. But that's not, that doesn't really give you the same information that would come out of the, that would come out of the EEG. And so we've, um, you know, we estimate that somewhere between 25, 20, 20, 25% of anesthesiologists might in some way use the EEG. And, you know, we'd like to see that be higher, ideally, you know, everybody, whenever it was possible, because we think that it gives information, which is, you know, very useful to understanding the state of the patient and also being able to drug, you know, diagnose, dose drugs in a, in, in a much more, in a much more principled fashion. So it hasn't penetrated as widely as, as we would like. But I think part of that just is helping, you know, expanding the educational efforts and also practice habits, you know, die hard because there, people have had success with them. But we think that there's a, a, a higher, a better level of success that can be had by using the EEG, you know, consistently and reliably in patients who are having anesthesia for surgery or, or, non, or invasive uh, diagnostic procedures. Yeah, it makes sense. Uh, fortunately, I lived both times, but probably would have been better if I had been hooked up to an EEG. Right. And then one sort of general comment about the EEG, which I should have mentioned earlier. So the EEG is used for a lot of things. Like I said, it's been around since 1929, you know, the original work of Hans Berger. So it's used for cognitive studies. It's used for, you know, to 
analyze the state of patients who maybe have brain injuries or who are in coma, you know, for sleep studies, in fact, the sleep is defined by, the sleep stages are defined by certain EEG states. And, you know, we use it now for biofeedback, you know, devices that you can just, you know, like wearables. But of all those things, of all those various applications of the EEG, the one where the signal to noise ratio is the highest is anesthesia. Because as we said, the drugs come in and they take over the brain circuits and they get them to work in concert and produce these large oscillations. And the other thing is that pretty much in any other circumstance where you use the EEG, you'd have noise because someone's moving around when they're sleeping or maybe someone who's in coma. Coma doesn't mean that you're, you're, you, know, you have no ability to move. You, know, you're, you have muscle tone and all these sorts of things. All that's gone once someone is under general anesthesia. So, you, so the, the E gender anesthesia has the highest signal to noise ratio of all the things which the EEG is used. So we have the highest, the strongest signal as anesthesiologists but we're the group that are inclined to use the EEG the least. And I, I just find that rather ironic. And I suppose that has an implication that because it's such a high signal to noise ratio, the training necessary to use it well ought to be less. We can make it very focused. And we have, you know, we have training programs online, EEG for anesthesia at irs.org, where you can take our training modules and learn in a very short period of time how to read the EEG under anesthesia. In fact, we have students who come and work with us for the summer, high school students, college students, and you know, they take the training course and then we can go in the operating room. We can ask them, you know, what anesthetic is that? You know, say that's Siva fluorine. How do you know? Oh, alpha oscillations, theta oscillations, and slow delta oscillations. Older young person, young person. You know, I mean, you know, it, it's it's totally tractable. So you know, we'll have to do more, we'll have to advertise more, but we think that there are very important benefits to be had there. It makes complete sense to me. If I go under again, I'll be looking for an anesthesiologist that knows this stuff. Let's go on to our next topic. We've talked mostly so far about propofol and the work you guys have done with that, but your teams have also worked with some of the other agents. The next one I want to ask briefly about is dexmedetomidine. How do I? Yeah, dexmedetomidine. Yeah, that's it. At least my takeaway from reading your papers on that was that it is more like sleep than propofol in that while it is engaging the corticothalamic networks, it has, seems to have less impact on the cortex to cortex networks. Is that uh, approximately correct? Yeah. I mean, so when we look at the EEG dynamics of someone receiving dexmedetomine at low doses or, or higher doses, they look very much like the patterns we see when someone's in one of the stages of non-REM sleep, either somewhere between non-REM stage two or non-REM stage three. And remember I said that the EEG is actually used, is one of the principal components used to define the stages of sleep in addition to, you know, maybe physiologic responses, heart rate and blood pressure and this sort of thing. But the EEG is one of the principal factors that's used. And when you look at the, like the deepest states of uh, sleep, which is like slow wave sleep, you see a, pre a predominance of oscillations that are somewhere between, again, like the 0 0.1 to, to um, you know, maybe 4 hertz, like I was talking about with anesthesia. Now, we have to be careful there because those slow wave oscillations are created by a different mechanism from the ones I was talking about for, for propofol, all right? So just because you see slow oscillations doesn't mean they correspond to the same brain state. Because remember, if you were in slow wave sleep and you're, and you're in a state where, I, where you're asleep and you had slow waves and I went and shook you and woke you up, I could wake you up. But by comparison, if you were in this, one of these slow wave states, which was induced by propofol and I shook you, I wouldn't be able to wake you up because the way the brain is turned off is different under one than it is in the other. The, the, the external manifestation is a slow wave. And the character of the slow waves are probably different. They're probably larger amplitude than the one when you're, when you're under propofol. But going back to dexmedetomidine, the dexmedetomidine slow oscillations seemingly come about by working on the primary circuits in the hypothalamus and brainstem that are associated with initiating sleep, probably areas coming out of the preoptic area of the hypothalamus, controlling um, you know, the arousal centers in the, in the brainstem. And the anatomy, the, the targets that the dexmedetomidine would hit these alpha-2 adrenergic receptors are on these areas like the, uh, 
the uh, locus ceruleus in the brainstem. And, and it's believed that this is an important network for turning the brain off during sleep. And it's probably no accident that the actions of dexmedetomidine on those same circuits produces patterns which look very much like sleep. So, so if you were to look at the EEG of someone under dexmedetomidine sedation, because it doesn't really produce as profound a state of unconsciousness as propofol does, unless you get very large doses, you would see patterns which would look very much like stages two and stages three of sleep. So stage two with spindles, oscillations that are kind of waxing and waning between about nine to 15 hertz, and then mixed in with slow oscillations. And then with non-REM stage three sleep, you would see these large slow oscillations. And that's approximately what you see when, you, when, you, uh, when someone receives dexmedetomidine for sedation. Interesting. Now, that an interesting probe on that, which was mentioned in one of your papers, is the question of subjective awareness of subjects during anesthesia. What do we know about that? I mean, do we, what do we remember? Do we dream or is there some other thing like dreaming? Is it dose dependent? Do different agents have different attributes? Go on a little bit about what we know about subjective awareness, you know, in anesthesia unconsciousness. Let's go back to propofol here. Because um, I think this is important to, and one of the reasons why we should use the EEG, because having awareness under anesthesia is probably something that, you know, you know we, get a, we get a lot of bad press about when it occurs, because it means that someone was awake under anesthesia and we didn't appreciate it, we didn't realize it. And, you know, I would submit this is a solved problem. Preventing this, is, I think, is a solved problem in 2020, because if you use the EEG and you understand how the, the dynamics of the, you know, what the dynamics of the oscillations mean, then you can use that to, to guide drug dosing and avoid you know, these, these states of, of awareness. So when someone is in the states that I was describing before with, pro, with propofol, where you have these slow oscillations and alpha oscillations, pure slow oscillations, again, with propofol, or you have like burst suppression or, or um, just the flat EEG, those people in those states are profoundly unconscious. They're not going to have any sort of subjective awareness, right? It's when you move to the lighter states, like when you have the beta oscillations or what have you, in the case of like propofol or the, uh, or the inhaled ethers, or you're perhaps in any one of the states like with dexmedetomidine, you could have, certainly have awareness because the brain is not as profoundly turned off. One of the best examples is with the opioids. So a standard practice in, in cardiac anesthesia, which began in the, the, uh, the latter part of the 60s, was using high doses of fentanyl, or, or actually morphine initially, but then eventually fentanyl is a synthetic opioid for cardiac anesthesia. The big upside was it gave a lot of stability to the cardiovascular system during the surgery. The downside was that it wasn't sufficient by itself to produce unconsciousness, so patients would have awareness, you know, during the, you know, during the surgery because the drug is primarily an antinociceptive agent. It turns off pain processing, but it doesn't sufficiently turn off arousal or the ability to, to process information consciously. So the fact that you could have these states is certainly the case. And if we're trying to prevent that, then using drugs whose mechanisms of action we are starting to develop a clear understanding of and what they mean neurophysiologically is basically the way to is basically the way to prevent that. And because nobody wants to, you know, be having, you know, major surgery and then, you know, be aware of what's going on. And I think that's totally preventable. And you know, again, when we hear these cases of people having these situations of arousal, I'm always curious as to know, were they, was, was the anesthesiologist using the EEG? And, you know, very often it's not the case. Interesting. Yeah. And I would say my two cases, I don't remember a damn thing. I counting down from 100, made it to about 97. Boom. Next thing you know, I woke up. <laughs> Life was good, right? Life is good. So the guys did their job. Another question and again, this kind of relates to sleep, particularly REM sleep. But actually, Jim, just on one point there, and sort of in doing their job, what they probably had to do was just err on the side of giving you probably more than you needed. Yeah, that's true. And that's the one of the benefits of your EEG approach. You can 
not have the risk of awareness without also buying the risk of overdosing or just getting too much. Right. And, and one of the things which is well recognized now is that as we get older, um, you know, the, the older brain, as you were suggesting, you know, earlier is more susceptible to older patients are more susceptible to brain dysfunction following, you know, following anesthesia. So trying to get the dose right is, I think is, is important in general, but it's especially important in older patients. Yeah. And as an older patient, I will agree with that. <laughs> Right. Yeah, I got my ARP card some time ago. <laughs> yep, so did I. I'm, I'm in a, a double digit number of years ago here as well. Yeah, same here. Same here. So we're, uh, we both should have concerns about this thing. So the next topic, which we talk about at least briefly, is the relationship between consciousness, anesthesia and motor centers. Particularly in REM sleep, we know that our motor centers are turned off. So while you may be dreaming of being chased by bad guys with red fountain pens for some god-awful weird reason, you don't actually be moving your legs and stuff. How does anesthesia work with respect to our motor centers? Well, so, so this is one of the big differences between like the inhaled drugs, particularly inhaled ethers and, uh, and like propofol. So just a, a, a two-second bit of anesthesiology history. So the first anesthetic that was identified as such was ether. And the first public demonstration of that took place in 1846, October 16th at Mass General Hospital. And it was done by, it was William Morton who anesthetized, you know, a patient of John Collins Warren who was having a tumor removed from his neck. So the, the patient was allowed to breathe in ether. He was, and then the word anesthesia didn't even exist then. He was given these vapors. He was placed in a state where the surgeon was able to successfully operate. And they, and then we realized that we had the first public demonstration of ether. And I, I say that because it's now well documented that probably the first person to use ether successfully was Crawford Long in, in, the, in Georgia back in 1842. But he didn't publish his results until like 1849. But so that's why I emphasize the first public demonstration of this. So the drug ether was given and it did everything. And remember, I gave you a definition of anesthesia at the start. You know, I said you had to be unconscious, you know, you know, um, not form any memories, you know, be insensate and not moving. So one of the things that the ethers do a lot better than and I, and I keep saying the ethers because we still use ethers today. So sevoflurane, isoflurane, and desflurane are modern day ethers. You know, they're, they're less flammable, they're more potent, but they're still ethers. So those drugs produce muscle relaxation in addition to making you unconscious. So they're, they're, they're the only drugs that we have, which we would consider to some extent, total anesthetics are able to get all of the characteristics of anesthesia. Propofol, on the other hand, is primarily a drug. We call it a hypnotic, but that's just anesthesia speak for meaning the drugs that primarily produces unconsciousness. Now, propofol also will produce some muscle relaxation because it acts at the level of the level of the spinal cord as well, and and, and also probably acts at like motor relays in, in the brainstem. So, so these drugs have very direct effects on the motor system. And, and, and so it, it, it makes sense that with the, when you, with the return of function following anesthesia and you see the, you know, the effects coming off of the muscles as well as the effects coming off of the circuits that are responsible for you know, cognition or arousal, that you, know, you start to see an increase in EMG act electromyogram, electromyogram activity you know, as, as the person returns. So the anesthetics are working on the motor system as well, they, they, not just on the circuits involved in, you know, in producing decreased arousal or producing altered levels of altered states of arousal. So I think that, you know, we, it's in, in fact, the, that was why ether was so good because it, you had one drug who fortunately, we know we didn't have this elaborate definition like I gave you at the outset. We had one drug that could basically do everything. And so now we use combinations of drugs, you know, to basically achieve the same, you know, to achieve the same states. So, but going back to what you were saying about uh, REM sleep. Yeah, so in REM sleep, it's one of the states, one of the states where we, you know, where we dream, but because our, our motor system is, roughly inhibited 
you're dreaming, but you're not moving around acting on those on those dreams. Whereas we also dream in 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 non REM sleep as well, and probably sleepwalking and a somnambulism is probably stage you know one of the probably stage two sleep. You know where again your your motor pathways are not inhibited, and as a consequence, you're able to maybe you know move around, you know, maybe act out or, or, or you know when you're when you're dreaming. So so there so there there is there are these you know there are these very and, and whether or not the 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 way that which the anesthetics inhibit, let's say, the motor pathways don't necessarily have to don't necessarily have to map on to the way the body inhibits the motor pathways during REM sleep, and so I I think that you know this is where maybe they're they're probably a less perfect model of this this one component of, of decreased arousal, which is you know REM sleep, as opposed to you know maybe. Um, as a model for like you're talking about dexmedetomine being a model for sleep propofol and its effects and the, the ethers their effects on the on the components of the motor system are probably not a good model for for like REM sleep inhibition of motor activity hmm, nice distinction nice distinction so we've talked a lot about research and thinking and experience in the clinical context your group also does some more theoretical work i read one paper maybe it was two where you guys had built simulations of the thalamocortical networks and their influence on propofol. Could you describe a little bit what your simulator setup was? We do talk about simulations and ancient base modeling here on the show a fair amount. So just a little bit about that technique and what you learned. Right. So we're in a very, you know, very good, uh, you know, I have the good fortune to be, you know, here in Boston where there are, you know, a number of people who have, you know, expertise in a number of different areas and we're able to collaborate with them. So like the human studies that I was describing earlier with the patients in the operating room, as well as, you know, the volunteer studies that I was mentioning the propofol. So those were done by my colleague, uh, Patrick Purden. And then as we executed those experiments and we started to see very robust dynamics coming out of the, the EEG, you know, we decided, and actually we decided this before we did these studies, because we had some idea that we would see these very rich dynamics coming out of the EEG, we figured we should have a program or, or parallel, a parallel research program that looked at trying to model those, that activity to understand why it was coming about. So that's a collaboration which has been ongoing now for, you know, at least 15 years with Nancy Capel, who's a very well-known, you know, mathematician who specializes in dynamical systems, particularly dynamical systems you know, that, that describe neural, neural circuits um, at, at Boston University. And so what we've done is we've taken the various stages. Propofol is the one we've dissected the most, as you suggest, dissected most carefully, as you suggested earlier. So as I, when I was describing the various stages that propofol goes through, propofol dynamics go through, you know, like, so first you're awake, you have, you know, low amplitude oscillations, then you maybe get a little, maybe larger when you go into this state of paradoxal excitation, then moving from there to beta oscillations, and then to slow oscillations and alpha oscillations on down to burst suppression. So we've done modeling work to describe pretty much all of those, all of those transitions because they help us understand the way, you know, we've posed the question with Nancy is given we see these oscillations, and they're not subtle. Like I said, they're probably the strongest EEG signal around. They're not subtle. Given that, given we know the architecture of the cortex, and you know, given we know something about the neurotransmitters that are that affect the neurons, you know, that are part of that that architecture, can we do simulation studies that will allow us to reproduce the oscillations that we see in the EEG when a patient is going through the various stages of anesthesia? And it turns out that that, that we can. So that's been very helpful to us as a way to add, add, add support, add sort of modeling support to the, you know, to the work that, um, that we've done, you know, experimentally recording the EEG. And like, so one of the things that came out of that was, you know, we saw these alpha oscillations and they, were, they had a very specific characteristic. And this is why it's important to emphasize 
you know, like this, the study that Patrick did in our human volunteers, where we recorded the CEG giving volunteers increasing and decreasing doses of propofol. The alpha oscillation wasn't just kind of willy-nilly all across the cortex. It was sitting primarily in the front of the head, in the front of the front of the scalp. And it suggested that, um, that, again, something which is like robustly found across all the 10 subjects that we looked at, you know, indicates that there should be a, a readily accessible mechanistic description or explanation for that phenomenon. And this is when, you know, with Nancy's help, we developed this model of these oscillations perhaps being in, you know, or this being sort of this kind of, kind of feudal oscillation going back and forth between the thalamus and cortex. And that made sense because our models show that as you increase inhibition, GABAergic inhibition across cortical thalamic networks, you could move from these high frequency gamma oscillations down to beta and also into alpha oscillations. And that the thalamus would do that, the cortex would do that, and they would lock in with each other. They'd lock in in the front, but not in the back because the neurons in the back had different properties, different channels. That's why we don't see it in the back. So what that meant was, is that it gave us an idea of what we should be looking for. And then we went on to do a series of additional experiments. So Francisco Flores, who's in our group, did experiments in rodents where he stuck electrodes in the thalamus and electrodes in the cortex and showed that that was indeed the case. We did, we did see these very coherent coupled oscillations between the thalamus and cortex, you know, when we anesthetize, you know, you know, rats with propofol. So the modeling was, was, and continues to be very, very useful for helping us organize our information and to think through what some of our next experiments should be. Very good. The other theoretical bit that I was taken to being a kind of a network complexity dude was your work on state space global coherence measures. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. So, you know, in we talked a bit earlier about a little bit about fMRI and um, with fMRI, you know, one of the things which is done, we were talking about the default mode networks, the default mode network determinations you know, are made by looking at correlations between different brain regions when some, when, a, when you're asking someone to lie into this state where they're essentially thinking about nothing, you know, doing nothing. And, you know, one of the things that makes the brain so interesting and so exciting is that it's never just really sitting still. It's, it's always dynamic. And so one of the things you realize is, is if you want to really track um, how brain networks are moving or so what, what the brain is doing, you have to have statistical techniques or signal processing techniques that allow you to follow dynamics. And so coherence, you know, just essentially measuring the correlation between two brain regions at a given frequency is a very natural way to start thinking about looking at relationships between brain regions because one, the correlation tells you something about whether or not they're coupled. And because i at least in for anesthesia, as I've been saying, the brain is producing, the drugs is, are inducing and maintaining these very strong and often inflexible oscillations in between different brain regions. So it makes sense that you would have a technique that would allow you to measure how tightly brain regions are coupled at a given frequency. And then you should be able to track that over time and see how it evolves. So that's what this state-space global coherence uh, idea is looking at. So the coherence is really just computing the correlation at a given frequency. So let's say to be very specific at 10 hertz, how tightly coupled is the frontal region in the brain, you know, let's say with a parietal region. So that's just a correlation. Now you can have a, a window a window, so you do that over various time windows. And so the, the state space idea is just to have a model of how that o- might evolve over time and then use that to track, you know, the, those brain dynamics. And the global coherence comes in where essentially you're looking at correlation, not just among pairs, but you're looking at correlations among a set of electrodes, you know, perhaps either in the same brain region or over you know, a number of or a number of different areas, you know, all at the same time. And that's just, you know, 
it's, it's, it's generalizing the idea of the simple correlation because there what you are doing is you have a matrix which describes the correlation between the various regions. And then for a given frequency, you can look at the eigenstructure of that matrix and, and the eigenstructure, the first ratio of the first eigenvalue to the others gives you a measure at that frequency of how tightly coupled that network is. And then you say, okay, now let, let that evolve in time. That's the state space part. So you can look at how a network is coupled or coherent over time as, let's say, a subject executes a task or moves through the different stages of anesthesia. And, and what have you found? Have you been able to run those numbers on the various states of consciousness, tasks, and unconsciousness? So we have. I mean, I think, to, to be fair, um, I think it's still a work in progress, you know, to really... You know, you know, um, we haven't we haven't done as many analyses or you know using these because some of these ideas we just developed in the last literally in the last year or year and a half or so. So I, I think the jury's out at the moment as to what they're telling us. But but we're we we certainly we certainly think they're going to give us a better sense of the, the dynamic structure within the data. That's going to then help us refine our modeling descriptions of the of the data and then from there i think it's going to guide our experiments so I, I, at the moment it's I, I would say it's a very very promising technique to be fair well, very good well we're coming up on our time check here so maybe for our last question will be what do you see new coming out of your lab and with your collaborators and in this domain you've been working on over the next few years I think, you know, starting from, you know, the most practical, I think that, you know, I think the most practical thing is what we talked about earlier, just really creating the knowledge base and, you know, a scientific knowledge base that's translated into, you know, clinical applications so that the EEG can be used as a, as a, as a meaningful tool to help guide, you know, the care of patients under anesthesia. Um, I, I see that as, you know, very, you know, very, very feasible. I think we have to make clearer to our anesthesiology colleagues, you know, why this is the case. And, and I think that, you know, part of the issue is that, you know, anesthesiology, as I said earlier, has been viewed as a subdiscipline of pharmacology, you know, and not neuroscience. And so this is a, a bit of a, a change in perspective. And this change in perspective but, but making it, I think, is going to be critical for improving care because, in other words, so much now is being learned by the, about the brain from studies in human studies and animal models. The whole brain initiative was set up to develop techniques that allow neuroscientists to interrogate the brain and, and extract information in ways that weren't possible before. If anesthesiology doesn't view itself as a subdiscipline of clinical neuroscience, then it's essentially shutting itself off to all those advances and what those advances can mean for patient care. So I think, you know, that putting the emphasis on the neuroscience and putting emphasis on the immediate benefits, which can be had by using, you know, the EEG in particular to guide patient care, I think is something which, you know, we're going to place a lot of effort on even more so than we have in the past. I think that, you know, developing better ways to monitor the brain, to understand more deeply what's what's happening in the brain under anesthesia. I think those things will also translate into other areas. I mean, you've probably heard about all this work that's going on now where ketamine, which is one of our core anesthetics, is used to treat depression. And, or for example, like you were mentioning before, dexmedetomidine, you know, closely resembles, you know, sleep. And so the way I like to think about it is anesthesia is solving the order zero problem. The brain is turned on, turn it off profoundly. But if what you do is you say, okay, turn it off, but turn it off in a physiologically sound way so that you can gain rest. Well, that's an approximation to sleep. Or if you want to turn it back on, you're turning the brain back on, turn it on in such a way that you're happier, you feel better. You know, therein lies a way to perhaps treat, you know, treat depression. Or like the changes that we saw with age, you know, just like we age different physically, it's clear from some of the data we've collected that people's brains also age differently as well. You know, could 
giving someone a dose of anesthesia and seeing what state their brain is in, could that be a diagnostic test for understanding, you know, brain age or brain state? The same way, if you really want to know whether or not someone is at risk for having a heart attack, you just don't have them walk across the floor. You actually put them on a treadmill and stress them and you try to induce the state. So could something similar be possible, you know, with, uh, you know, with anesthesia? So I think that, you know, going forward, embracing this neuroscience paradigm is central to the future development of, of, of anesthesia is going to offer greater benefits for taking care of patients in the operating room, but also perhaps open up new areas of, of research where concepts from anesthesia can maybe feed over into other areas of you know, neurology and psychiatry, maybe perhaps sleep medicine, and you know, move those fields forward as well. Well, that's very hopeful and extremely interesting. I'll continue to be following your work to see what comes next. I'd like to thank you very much for a wonderful talk where we got into some deep things, but you made it very clear. Yeah, I really appreciate it, Jim. It's so kind of you to have me on. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. That's been great. Production services and audio editing by Jared Janes Consulting. Music by Tom Muller at modernspacemusic.com.